Today, we're going to talk about climate change, but we're going to go way deeper than that. We're going to talk about uh, environmental inequality and what are the public health implications. And I promise to spend a good deal of time talking about how these issues resonate locally. You know, it's one thing to think about climate change from a global context, but I think it's very important that we uh, share a significant or spend a significant portion of today's discussion looking at some local implications. So the very first thing that I want to do after I set my timer is just to really give a thanks to the Manlius Library, Bill Loveland for reaching out. It is an absolute honor to be here today and I'll explain to you very briefly why. I am a huge fan of the Onondaga County Library System. Usually it's the other way around. I'm begging a branch, hey, can I come and talk about I-81 environmental impacts? Can I come and talk about my urban forestry projects? So when Bill reached out a couple of weeks ago, I was floored. Um, this is not hyperbole when I say that to me, public library systems may be the last and most effective hub and of trusted systems and institutions in this country. And I think that the Onondaga system is the creme de la creme. If you follow my social media, you actually see where I've posted my receipts and it shows that, hey, you've saved $10,000 uh, by spending time and uh, spending time with the Onondaga Library System. So it's an honor to be here today. Thank you all uh, for showing up. I'm going to start today, give you a very brief background who I am. I'm not just a talking head that speaks about climate change. I'm a real human uh, that exists. So I am on faculty at SUNY ESF, and specifically, if you're familiar with the campus, you can find me in the Environmental Studies Department, where I've been on faculty since 2016. Um, in addition to that, I write a lot about environmental and social economic issues. You can see that uh, paper in the middle. It deals specifically with energy policy. And then in the far right, I see a few of my loyal readers on today. I have a quasi reoccurring column in the uh, Syracuse Post Standard. Uh, and you can check that out online. I'll add some links later. So if I say something compelling today and say, hey, I want to be this guy's fifth and sixth loyal reader, then you can definitely check me out uh, online. But let's talk about where it begins. You don't just pop up at SUNY ESF in the middle of 2016 to uh, study and teach and do research related to environmental science. This is a journey that began literally decades ago. So in the 1980s, you know, I was really tuned into environmental science programming. I was thinking about public health at a very young age. Why? Because of public health programs. So we really need to get young people involved if we're going to increase science literacy. And this is a screenshot, or this screenshot is from uh, the National Institutes of Health right outside of DC in the early 1990s, maybe late 1980s. And if you look close enough in the lower right-hand corner, you may or may not see me. Let's spend 10 seconds. Can anybody spot me? Look close, look close. You get a prize if you can. There he is. Yeah, so this is really a, a 30 year process in the making. Enough about me though. Let's talk about my research and then we're gonna morph the conversation to environmental justice, climate change and public health. So I kind of got a name in this region very early on. Uh, due to my work with I-81 or the, the, the reinterpretation or reimagining of I-81. And I moved to Syracuse, like I said, in 2016. I knew nothing about I-81 as a problematic infrastructure. Hell, I didn't know what a viaduct was, and I have an engineering degree. So I moved here August of 2016. Maybe two months later, I got an email from a local group, Southside TNT, which is the local community organization. They're saying that there's about to be a redevelopment of this massive interstate project. Can you come and give an environmental justice analysis? And I was happy to because it was such an organic process. So often in this business, academics kind of race and can I study your pain for a living? And I never wanted to participate in that level of exploitation. So the fact that the local community reached out to me and said, hey, we see that you have a lens, will you please apply it? I was very excited. So you can see me right now, you see the dome, whatever they call the dome now, I know it's recently changed its name. My office is just south of the dome, look very closely, just south of the dome. Do you see me waving at you? No, that's a joke. That's obviously, I'm not waving, uh, Bill laughed. So I got it, <laughs> one person got the joke. <laughs> 
And then, like I said, I've been thinking about these issues for the last five or six years. This was a piece that I wrote. This is the first piece I wrote in the Post Standard uh, several years back. And here is someone's imagining of what urban progress looks like, not my imagining. So you have an interstate that is literally uh, on top of people's homes. And guess what? If that's not enough for you, you got a, a natural gas power plant in the back. So uh, th th that's kind of how I was introduced into the community in terms of local environmental issues. Here's another shot, basketball court. And from a planning and engineering perspective, this is awesome, right? We can build an interstate 15, 20 feet in the air, uh, but from a social development standpoint, a public health standpoint, this is a disaster. And this is not just a Syracuse issue. We go to Rochester, we'll see a skate park. We go to Wilmington, Delaware. I can pretty much name any city in the country and you'll see children who have this type of proximity to transportation projects. And uh, here was just some commentary. Please, I'll put a, a posting of this article up uh, at the end of today's conversation. And, you know, the folks to the right, they had one interpretation, but uh, I'll let you come to your own conclusions. But let's kind of move forward now that we've gotten past the introduction. And I want to talk about climate change today. So I'm very appreciative of your time. And let's lay the groundwork. So I know we're probably having all types of community members at today's conversation. So just to be clear what climate change is, we are talking about changes in usual climate patterns, typically measured in months, seasons, or years. So you're not talking about day-to-day -day fluctuations or week-to-week -week fluctuations. What are some examples of climate change? Us having more or less 90 degree days over a long period of time, uh, prolonged drought, increased snowfall, or uh, significant drops in snowfall, all those can be examples of what climate change looks like. And then just very briefly, what's causing climate change? Look at that image to the left, and you'll see the naturally occurring greenhouse gas effect. So, you know, if we were to go back about three or four centuries, that's what your naturally occurring greenhouse gas effect. We're talking about the trapping of uh, excess heat uh, in our planet's atmosphere due to an increase of what we call greenhouse gases, things like carbon dioxide, methane. And then if you look at the, the visuals to the right, you will see two sources of climate change or two sources of that heat trapping. You have carbon dioxide, uh, and this is caused by exuding fossil fuels, cement production, and then you also have excessive levels of methane production. And then finally, on the lower right-hand corner, you can see, uh, you can contrast different uh, national economies' contributions to greenhouse gas emissions. And, you know, you're talking about going back 30 or 40 years, and you can contrast the EU, United States, China, Brazil, et cetera. And then some of the implications, as we all know, I mentioned increased 90 degree days, snowfall fluctuations. Uh, here's just one uh, very good graph that shows you the rise in temperature in the lower 48 states uh, over the last 120 years. So you can see that, look at, the, pay attention to that last 30 or 40 years, you can see substantial surface level and troposphere temperature increases and your troposphere is your lower level of the atmosphere. You can see substantial increases of surface and troposphere temperature over the last 30 or 40 years. Just one way of measuring that our climate is changing. So we're not just gonna talk about climate change today, we're also gonna talk about well, what are the on the ground implications, right? Not everybody's going to experience climate change similarly. So that's why we have a field of study called environmental justice and environmental justice claims are based around this very beautiful definition. It contends that every person has the right to a decent, safe quality of life for people of all races, incomes, cultures, and the environments where we live, work, play, learn, and pray. So if you're like me, when you were being grew or raised in the 1970s, 80s, or 50s, when you thought about environments, at least within a scholastic or school context, you probably thought about, well, going up to the Adirondacks or going to the mountains or the deserts. But we know the environments are the places that we exist. Think about what our environment, even pre-pandemic, typical American, average American spending 90 plus percent of their time indoors, that's an environment, right? And if you have indoor 
uh, living conditions that aren't safe, then you are environmentally exposing yourself to some hazard, hazardous things. So that's a very busy, it's a beautiful definition, but when I break it down to my intro students, I like to say environmental justice is what? It considers how structural inequality shapes environments. So we're talking about climate change, realize not everybody's gonna have the same experience. Your community can have an excessive level of 90 degree days, but if you have the luxury of just turning your air conditioning on, eh, no big deal, at least in your household. If you are income insecure, low income household, that may not be the case. Medically fragile populations, elderly populations are gonna experience climate change a lot differently. And then I want us finally thinking about well, what are the on the ground impacts and implications of climate change. So what are some public health implications and I'm going to next show you a very beautiful illustration by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And this really illustrates a lot of the on the ground impacts from a human health standpoint that arise from our changing climate. So we're not gonna go through all of these areas, but let's just pick one right now. And the, the one I'm thinking about is changes in vector ecology, because I see that as something that may have, and many others as well, that may have a pronounced impact on human health in upstate New York and many other places. So if you look to the right side of your screen, maybe about 2.30, 2.15, you will see a kind of a golden color, a dark gold, changes in vector ecology. So as we think about how local ecologies change due to climate change, then the proliferation of some diseases in the region, one that we're very concerned about, like Lyme disease, we know it's already a, a problem in upstate New York, but it may be an explosion of Lyme disease uh, due to the changes in local ecology. So we have to be very careful uh, that we understand climate change, not just uh, what's going to be hotter or not because sea level rise may be a problem in Boston or Washington or uh, Accra or uh, any points, uh, disparate points across the planet, there are some local real implications to evolving climate that are going to touch central New York. So if you think that Lyme disease is a problem now, there are many dire projections that say that things may get worse. And we have an opportunity. The window is closing and we in central New York or folks in uh, the Northeast, we won't be able to attack these problems alone because this is a global issue, right? When you think about proliferation of those greenhouse gases that I spoke about a couple minutes ago, you're not gonna solve that on your own, uh, but, but we have the opportunity to think collectively and engage in collective action. Go down to about six o'clock on your screen, you can see some other areas. So if you have increased drought, if you have a number of uh, elevated 90 degree days, 100 plus degree days, that's gonna impact your water and food systems. And that's not just a human health, uh, uh, that's not just a human health impact. You start messing with water and food systems and shortages happen in that space, then you will probably see increases in militaristic and hostile activity. People get very nervous. You saw a couple years ago when there were shortages of food in your local grocery store, still relative, relative abundance. You know, people started getting nervous because there wasn't enough toilet paper. Now imagine you go into your local grocery store and you can't get dietary staples. And this is something that's not going to just be played out at your local supermarket. When you bring in nation state interventions, uh, the, the prospects can be very, very dire. Oh. Scary. And then, you know, go back to what I was saying a couple minutes ago. Think about environmental justice. How do we communicate these messages, right? 340 million plus people in this country alone if we just have one way of conveying this message, think about Syracuse, North, the thousands, north side of Syracuse, 10,000 plus new Americans that have entered into our community over the last uh, decade or so. If we're just communicating uh, that message through one means, you're not going to be ample. So when we think about conversations like today, when we think about the outrage, outreach that your local governments are doing, your universities are doing, that your scientific community is doing. If you want to make people who are part of that conversation, who have historically been locked out, historically been marginalized, historically been disenfranchised, you need to think about environmental communication, public health communication through a bevy of means, 
So newsprint, social media, but also through a bevy of languages, right? Because if we think about 340 plus million Americans, millions of those who are speaking languages other than English, then outreach has to be sufficient in these communities. Otherwise, we're kind of purveying a message that everybody doesn't have a part to play. So just something to keep in the back of your mind, something to think about. So what about locally? And I'd love to come back to some of those public health implications a little bit later in today's Q&A, but let's talk about some of the local implications of climate change. And we'll focus on the Northeast region because that's where we're at. So it's very difficult you know, to say, well, Manlius is gonna, spend, uh, gonna experience climate change in this fashion, or this is gonna be what happens in Fayetteville or Rochester or Syracuse, but we can make regional projections relatively assuredly. So some of the areas, when you think about the good work of the Environmental Protection Agency, some of the areas when they're looking at disparate regional impacts, they're looking at human health implications. What are the implications for sea level rise? Well, we don't have to worry about that so much, but maybe we do based on some things that are happening in New York City and Boston. We'll get to that momentarily. We certainly should be attuned to what's going on precipitation wise, right? Maybe you'll see decreased snowfall, maybe you'll see more rainfall, or maybe you'll see more snowfall. Uh, changes to agricultural systems. You remember a few minutes ago, I was speaking about, A, hey, some things that may be happening in grocery stores. Uh, as a consequence of that, you may see more conflict. And then what is, we can talk about environments all day, but I'd love for us to start thinking a little bit more about ecologies, right? This planet exists outside of humans. And you know, I'm pretty optimistic when uh, Mr. Howie Hollander's taking my class, he'd probably argue, well, you're kind of cynical when it comes to some of these issues. I'm pretty optimistic about the fate of the planet. So whether we, whether or not we do the right thing, the planet's gonna keep on spinning. Planet's gonna keep existing, but we still need to think about ecosystems outside of humans' responsibilities, outside of humans' existence, outside of human livelihoods within these things. And then we can also think about winter recreation. If this boils down to just the economic conversation to you, hey, that's fine, that's your business. We can start to think about how may climate change impact local industry like recreation. So just here's a couple of examples. Look at this uh, EPA uh, visual on your left side. And this EPA visual is showing us a couple of different scenarios for 90 degree days in the region. So the dark amber color, the darker you are on that table or that chart, that means the more 90 plus degree days that you're gonna have under low emission scenarios, meaning, well, maybe we get our act together and we're not gonna emit on a global level. We're not talking about local level emissions, we're talking about global level emissions. So maybe you get your act together and you say, I'm gonna tighten my belt and not pollute so much into the atmosphere. Then you can see there's a certain scenario that says, well, you're gonna see more 90 degree days based on what we've been doing over the last 100, 200 years during industrial times. But you can see that this region, specifically central New York, western New York, eh, you're not going to see a substantial difference, right? You're going to see more 90 degree days. But then you look at that scenario uh, under the higher emission scenario, and you can see, well, there are more 90 plus degree days encroaching, right? And then look down to the, uh, the southeast of us. Look at Washington, D.C. Look at Philadelphia. Look out in uh, downstate New York that region of the country under either scenario is set or slated to receive massive amounts of 90 degree days. And that's gonna be a consequence that central New York has to deal with, right? So it's not just a threat from coastal floodwater inundation that's going to be a problem for the East Coast as uh, the region just becomes less comfortable as the Atlantic coast becomes less comfortable than places like Rochester, places like Buffalo, places like Syracuse are going to become more attractive and that attractive, excuse me, and that can bring its own set of uh, tension to the region. But we'll get to that in a minute. Let's stay with the local ecology. Look now to the uh, EPA chart on the right side of your screen and you can see the change to forest cover. So you have any number of species of trees under those two scenarios we just spoke about, low emissions, high emission scenarios, you're talking about the changes in local tree canopies. And that can have 
uh, implications in terms of this, the extinction of local species, that can have implications on the spread of different disease vectors, that can ultimately have implications uh, in terms of how comfortable uh, your, local or your local environment is. Those trees keep our neighborhoods cooler. And if we want to see less 90, 90 degree days, excuse me, then we would do well to say, you know what, we're going to do our best to preserve those canopies. So these are things I've thought about for a long time. And once again, I'm gonna share a link with you at the end of today. So if what I'm talking about resonates with you, we can't get but so deep in the next 50 minutes or so, but I'd love to share my research with you. So I'll, I'll post a link to some of these articles and you can see uh, the, the, the implications, some of the specific local, local implications that I've been thinking about for quite some time. So go back to Syracuse as a potential uh, hub. You think about places on the Atlantic coast that become less habitable. At the beginning of today's conversation, one of our friends said, hey, I'm in NYC right now. So it's spaces and places along the Atlantic coast, whether you're talking about the U.S. Southeast, whether you're talking about the Northeast, as those places become more under pressure from things like increased temperatures, but more specifically, uh, the exposure to extreme weather events like superstorms, hurricanes, as those areas face more threats from things such as sea level rise, then you can certainly imagine migration situations where the new locales to be are gonna be places like Syracuse. Why? Well, we're pretty far inland. You don't have to worry about the sea level rise. We have some very good environmental amenities. Uh, from what I understand, the chemists you speak to, they'll speak virtues about the quality of drinking water uh, that we have in this region, right? So you need to start thinking, well, more people competing for resources, what does that mean for water quality? What does that mean for the scarcity of water in this region? So these are some things that we need to think about in scenario building, right? So it's not just the environmental pressures or it's not just the physical phenomena to climate change that we need to be concerned and mindful about. We also need to be mindful about, well, what are the human responses? So things like how may climate migration impact our local water systems? How may it affect our recreational systems, right? More people skiing in the region, well, that may place pressure on systems, right? More people using bike lanes, that may place pressure on systems. We want more people using bike lanes, but you get the point that I'm making. And then you think about that transportation infrastructure. You may have thought, hey, I came here to talk about climate change. I didn't come here to talk about grids and interstates, et cetera. So if you think about well, what is the transportation infrastructure in our region, not just the car centric or bus centric infrastructure, and how conducive is that if we say add 15 or 20,000 people over the next couple of decades, right? And then finally, what's our housing situation? And as you know, there's huge gulfs in housing quality across the region, right? So if you come and uh, you migrate close to inner city Syracuse, you may see a host of inundated housing, housing that is substandard just due to the uh, presence of lead, other conditions not properly weatherized. But then as you go further out from the city core, housing stock gets substantially newer. What's going to be the impact in terms of folks from the, the, the Atlantic coast coming? Maybe they have deep pockets, maybe they're working remotely. Is there going to be constraints on your local housing networks and housing systems. So let's bring this back to environmental justice. If we realize that climate change is not just a uh, phenomena of chemistry and physics, if you realize that there are some real socioeconomic implications, then let's start thinking about how inequality may be exacerbated under some of these scenarios I've been talking about. Think about who's gonna be on the front lines, not just in uh, New York City, not just on Long Island, but think about well, who's on the front lines in central New York, right? Who's most likely to be displaced? Who is not going to be, or who's at a higher level of susceptibility or vulnerability of being displaced, right? And then if we introduce several thousand more people into our region, then what implications is that gonna have for affordability concerns?
So we know that, let's talk about the real, you know, if we're gonna have the climate conversation, if we're gonna talk about environmental justice, let's talk about the on the ground conditions that I'm seeing and hopefully you're seeing as well. There was a US Census Bureau, just don't pay attention to the screen for a minute, just listen to me, please. There's a US Census Bureau report that was released a couple of weeks ago. And of any city in this country with 100,000 plus people, I'm for sure you saw this report, Syracuse was number one, a national leader in childhood poverty. More than 49%, almost half of every child in the city of Syracuse lives in an impoverished household. That is a moral disgrace, right? One out of every two children in the city of Syracuse is living in an uh, impoverished household. And guess what? The threshold for poverty is very, very low. Uh, the, the official number is a family of four. I think that the, a family of four who makes above $25,000, they're considered not to live in an impoverished household. But trust me, as everybody here knows, if you're a family of four living in Syracuse, you can be making $32,000 a year, you're living in poverty. But just think about this for a second. It's a moral failure, right? One out of every two children in the city of Syracuse lives in poverty. So think about this from this context. Poverty so pervasive in the city that every day, in Syracuse City School District schools, every child is eligible for a free lunch. Why? Also a free breakfast due to a community-wide exemption. There are so many impoverished households that just across the board, you have a community-wide exemption. And we know that a lot of poverty within the city and also the region, it plays out along racial lines. And this was a report that came out from a, uh, our, my uh, cross-campus neighbors that a uh, large private school uh, seven years ago. And you can see the racialized implications of concentrated poverty. And right here, you have two different charts. It looks at the concentrations of poverty amongst uh, Black Syracusans as well as Latino, Latina Syracusans. And these are numbers that just can't be justified in any decade, but certainly they can't be justified in the 21st century. So we think about it, low income households, they're going to have a less amount of resilience. They're going to have a less capacity, a lesser capacity to resist against climate change. Because if you're living in poverty in Syracuse, no matter what color you are, uh, but you're going to be less likely to turn on an AC during the 90 degree days. Maybe you're living in a uh, medically underserved community. You don't have access to uh, you, you don't have access to appropriate uh, medical care. So these are all the things we need to be thinking about. It's not just the phenomena, more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. It's also going to be about well, who's going to be resilient on the ground level. And if we're not talking about racialized poverty in Syracuse, in Onondaga County, in central New York, then we're playing games, right? We're wasting each other's time. If we're acting like that there is no racial dimension, then you know, we're not having a sophisticated conversation. You know, since I got here, the one thing I always say, you want to talk about uh, economic segregation in the region, and I always say, hey, you hang out downtown Syracuse during rush hour in the morning, and then do so again in the afternoon. Look who's going into buildings. Maybe more importantly, look who's not going into buildings, right? Look at who's not getting jobs. So that impacts how resilient you're going to be against some of these phenomena. And we know this stuff doesn't happen in the bubble, right? You know, folks didn't just wake up and say, hey, I'm in a low income household. We know that just like uh, urban planning decisions that were made early in the 20th century, they impact traffic patterns, they impact air pollution. They also have implications on climate change. And I'm gonna show you some uh, graphics. I had a little overtime session today, uh, if we're looking good on time. Uh, but I'm going to show you how urban planning decisions that were made uh, due to a process called redlining in the 1930s and 40s, they have urban heat implications in a city near you. So if you're interested in the history of redlining in this region or any region across the country, I beseech you go to a very good website from the University of Richmond called Mapping Inequality. And they can show you the history, they'll show you redlining documents, uh, not just the maps, but you can find specific a language that showed well, what is going to be the racialized context as to how these development patterns happen. 
So just a preview for this overtime, I go to every city or I go to every community, every neighborhood in the city of Syracuse. I'm working at a USDA funded grant right now. And I go to every community in the city of Syracuse and we'll spend a little time talking about these urban heat island maps. Now I'm previewing this to Manlius because this is a three year grant that we're working on. So for the first two years of the grant, we're actually in the city of Syracuse. And in years uh, three, uh, year 2.1 through the end of year three, we're actually going to be at other parts of the region. So if this uh, work, if the, the, the work of urban heat islands resonates with you, if you find that increases in temperature disparities uh, are a frightful thing, whether you live in Fayetteville, Manlius, East Syracuse, or wherever, then let's make sure that we stay in contact after today's talk. And then just very briefly, as we think about these maps right here, uh, this is a, a map that we created uh, with my, uh, my co-conspirators on this grant uh, in the lower left, we can think about the economic implications. So as I was kind of merging the conversation between, well, increased number of 90 degree days, well, what is the social economic context? Whose neighborhoods are most susceptible? You go down to the south portion of the city, you go down to the southwestern portion of the city, look at these numbers, right? 45% of 186, that's a, a geographic or place-based designation from the U.S. Census Bureau. Most of these blocks are low income. So we're talking about heightened amounts of uh, Black, Native, uh, Latino, Latina populations, but also coupled with pervasive poverty. So you go down to the southwestern portion of the uh, I-81 study area, look at that, median income unfathomable in upstate New York in the 20th century, 19,645 bucks a year. Now in the 1950s, that might've been the creme de la creme income for the region, uh, but you know, it, it's just not a sustainable wage. It's not a healthy wage in the 21st century. A little bit better on the South uh, study area up to $33,000, but compare that contrast to that, that to the region the whole, as a whole, excuse me, you're talking about in one case, $20,000 less, you're talking about in another case over $30,000 less. And let's go back to housing, right? So it's one thing for us to talk about, well, you're gonna see migrations and maybe people will be pushed out and folks are living in substandard housing, but you think about that $19,000 a year, you think about that $33,000 a year, your capacity to turn up your air conditioning or your capacity to turn up your heat in a, in a Syracuse winter that can be brutal. A lot of scholars have been thinking about this for a long time, right? So every winter, uh, some folks on today's call may be faced with these propositions, right? Or these conundrums, these choices, false dichotomies, right? Because it's not really a choice. Do I heat my home this week or am I going to feed my children? So plenty of literature online. And if you're not familiar, if you're not, uh, if you want to know more about this discourse, heat or eat, right? Do I turn up my heat or do I feed my family this week? And we see the same thing, more 90 degree days. I call it chiller meal. You know, maybe I coined that real time. Maybe somebody else used it. But the point is, am I going to cool my home due to an excessive number of 90 degree days or are we going to have adequate provisions? So just one more iteration, one more potential spillover consequence of more 90 degree days. And then once again, so you know, we have a wide level of considerations here in central New York. So it's not just a, a thermostat issue. Think about some other conditions that are going on in the house that we need to be dealing with concomitantly or concurrently. It's not just a matter of I'm indoors all day. Let me turn up my AC. We know that many homes in the, in the region don't have adequate uh, heating and cooling. And then you couple that with other indoor threats, things like excessive levels or not excessive levels, the presence of lead-based paint, right? If you live in a home before built before 1978, particularly built in, uh, living, living in a home built before the 1960s, the chances are that you're going to have lead-based paint in that home. And typically on the walls, that's not where your threat is. Your true threat is going to be your windows and doors. And trust me, there are plenty of homes in our community. They don't have those new, weathered, those new weatherized uh, windows and doors. So you're talking about you know, windows, doors, 30, 40, 50, 60 years old uh, that have been treated in excess of 30, excuse me, but 40, 50, 60 years old that have the lead-based paint. And trust me, when you're lifting them up and down, opening, closing, shut, 
that's going to create chafing, that's going to create lead dust. And a lot of times the exposure, it's not through a child kind of chipping paint off the wall, it's through that lead dust exposure. So as you're thinking about our resilience to climate change, let's capture two birds with one hand. If we want to make Syracuse housing stock uh, more palatable, when you're going into weatherize, let's also think about how we can insulate and let's have a lead-based paint remediation strategy that makes every child in our region uh, safe. So I wanna spend the last 15 to 20 minutes of today's conversation, let's talk about transitions. And I see I'm about at 35 minutes. So let's go for about another 10 minutes and then we'll take some Q and A. So let's talk, we can talk about pain and problems all day, but let's start thinking about what are some strategies? And I just mentioned one when we talked about weatherization and capturing two birds with one hand. So it's not as simple as, and I know this is a very busy slide, but it's intentionally busy. This is a study of me and some folks I do research with. We did this a couple of years back and we're looking at energy systems and we're saying, let's do life cycle analysis for any type of energy system, whether it's fossil fuel based. You remember I showed you that smokestack or that uh, natural gas plant right next to Pioneer Homes, oldest housing project in New York state. It's not as simple as just critiquing fossil fuels. We also need to hold any energy system, whether it be renewable, fossil fuels, or whatever, we need to hold those energy systems under that same level of scrutiny. So we're going to ask some questions, right? As we had this renewable energy transition in upstate New York, how many of the workers that we hiring? Are these folks local? Do folks have access to health care? What are the generation methods employed? Are they locally appropriate, right? Do you have community buy-in? Do you have proliferation just for the people that can afford $20,000 of solar shingles on top of their homes? Or do we have strategies that are a bit more democratic? These are the questions we need to be asking if we're serious. So let's think about some pathways for it. Go back to that EPA slide, or excuse me, go back to that CDC slide I shared with you uh, earlier in today's conversation. Well, what is the local healthcare strategy uh, with the advance of climate change? If nothing else, the pandemic has exposed vulnerabilities in our healthcare system. So as we think about, well, it, at some point COVID-19 is going to be more palatable, uh, as a society, we're going to say we've dealt with it or it's at a level where most people are comfortable with moving on with their lives, no matter you know, what those graphic charts that we see on a weekly basis say. But as we transition to think about climate again, what is our regional climate change human health strategy? If we're not thinking about the proliferation of Lyme disease, if we're not in thinking about uh, pockets, large clusters of respiratory illness, you know, respiratory illness rates in a neighborhood in the south side of Syracuse, highest respiratory illness rates in the state with the exception of the South Bronx. And you're talking about globally notorious, uh, globally high uh, respiratory illness rates. So what is our regional health care strategy? And is it a thing? Well, hey, mom and dad have, have health care. Those kids are going to be OK. And if you don't have access to 21st century health care, then you're just going to have to deal with a uh, six hour ER week. It's just not a sensible strategy. So I want us to think about these things. And then go back to that slide I showed you a couple of minutes ago as we engage in this renewable energy transition. We've talked about the dichotomies and who's getting jobs in rush hour in Syracuse or who's showing up to work and who's not. Let's think about this as an opportunity for 21st century world-class training and education related to renewable energy systems, right? What is it gonna be look like? You know, we're spending $85 million apparently on a, an aquarium. What would it look like if we say we have a similarly ambitious effort to be the national leader, uh, not just for recreational purposes or not just for uh, festive purposes, but we're going to be a national leader in training around geothermal, uh, solar, uh, solar energy and any other number of renewable energy strategies that are locally appropriate. And that's why we have to do the work. It's not enough to just say hey, we train some men and women to go on top of a house and put some shingles enough. You know, we got to ask some serious questions. Who's getting trained? What do wages look like? Is this safe work and how can we make it safer? Are children involved? Uh, where are we sourcing these materials from? Uh, 
Are there violent conflicts involved? So it's not enough to say, hey, I got an EV in my garage or I got shingles on top of my house. We got to ask some deeper questions because if the renewable energy transition looks like the fossil fuel transition, then you are going to see one that is very uneven in its impacts and its benefits. And then finally, let's talk about community health. You know, I was mentioning that 50% of children in uh, uh, the city, city of Syracuse, are unfortunately uh, in low-income households. And this leads to a, any number of things that are unconscionable, food insecurity, housing insecurity, uh, problems with concomitant threats like lead poisoning, medical fragility, et cetera. So as we think about that, what is our local food policy? Do we care to have a food policy, right? So we have a recreation policy. If we have an economic development plan, let's start thinking seriously. Let's start uh, pushing local tastemakers and policymakers. What is our regional uh, food plan or food policy? What is our regional housing policy that says, you know what? not just poor people, not just rich people, every person in central New York is going to have access to adequate housing that is climate conducive, sensitive, and conscious. And then let's think about the concomitant threats. We know if you think about COVID-19, we know that folks with pre-existing uh, illnesses were at a lot higher rate to be hospitalized and unfortunately face an early demise. Are we thinking about our, uh, the possibilities that climate change is going to lead to workforce development as we get more into people's homes and we uh, rehab houses that can lead to a potential to do other things, weatherize homes, make them lead safe, et cetera. Let's not lose this opportunity, folks. And then just the, the what's the uh, political and legal diet for all this activity? Uh, New York State passed a landmark piece of legislation three years ago, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. I'm currently working on that top bullet, New York State's Climate Impact Assessment. I'm in the Energy Working Group. And if you know a lot about this space, if you think about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, this is basically this state's version of the IPCC coupled with a climate action plan. Let's talk more about just transitions and reimagining the region, not just a rich section or not just an impoverished section. How can we transition and reimagine this entire region? And then finally, what does our messaging look like? What does our communication, what does our outreach look like? If it's just the 15 people on today's call that are talking these issues, that's not gonna be enough to move the conversation forward. Let's think about the hundreds of thousands of people in this region and what we all have at stake and how we can, uh, we can create a catalyst that's community-wide and democratized ultimately. So just a little bit more about the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. It is an avant-garde piece of legislation, not perfect, but in terms of what's going on across the country, it is a forward-thinking piece of legislation. And just look very briefly, some of the things it's doing. It's committing the state to net zero emissions. There's some wrangling about that language, but for the sake of today's conversation, it commits New York to net zero emissions, massive energy and emissions reductions, excuse me, massive emissions reductions over the next couple of decades. And then you can look specifically at those targets based on renewable energy by 2030, which is only what, seven and a half years away, 70% of your energy should be coming from renewables uh, on a state level. And then finally, it has specific language about disadvantaged communities. So 40% of all climate program benefits, according to this legislation, is going to be targeted to disadvantaged communities. So there's one problem with that is when this law came into effect, it didn't define what is a disadvantaged community. Is it somebody that lives in a rural space? Uh, is it based on race? Is it based on income? So states really playing catch up now to define that. Excuse me. Once again, not a perfect piece of legislation, but an ambitious piece of legislation nonetheless. And then just wrapping up, just a few more closing comments. Let's keep the same energy. We get very excited. We see these public-private partnerships around EV charging station. Yay, we have one in my neighborhood. Or yay, the shopping center down the street. I can now charge my EV for free. I don't need to put one in my garage. I'm not talking about myself. I don't have one of these nice $40,000 vehicle. So we can think about the subsidies that have come through where you get 10,000 plus bucks or $12,000 on your EV. 
for so many of the households we've been speaking about today, what part do they have to play? You, know, you can give somebody a $30,000 subsidy if you don't have the $15,000 to finance or outright to buy one of these cars, then this is a moot point. So I say, let's keep the same energy around these EV charging stations and let's think about some more democratized technology. Let's have the same energy for techniques and strategies like community solar or geothermal or whatever locally appropriate strategy that we deem fit that says every central New Yorker should have a part to play and should have some benefits to gain from climate planning. So it looks like we have some time for overtime, but let me just very briefly plug uh, if I've said anything compelling today, you can check me out on social media. Uh, I'm actually not, it looks like Twitter is about to be privatized. So that may be the best thing to happen to me because I'm not spending a lot of time on the technology these days. But if you're on Twitter, uh, you're welcome to join me there. More importantly, check my website out. All the articles I mentioned today, anything that I do uh, in a public space, like a newspaper, I put all my stuff up online for free. Once again, democracy. You shouldn't have to pay for it through an academic firewall to access a, a peer reviewed article and pay 30 bucks for it. who's doing that. So because I have publicly facing work, if you're interested in it, check my website out and uh, you can read more of my stuff there. So I'm going to stop sharing this screen for just a minute. And I just want to do a little overtime sharing with a project that has a lot of local implications. And once again, first couple of years of this project, we're in Syracuse, but the third year, we look to talk more broadly about what are some regional implications. So this is something you can see I did less than a month ago on the west side. So any of you ever spend time in Tip Hill, I did this presentation at Hazard Branch Library. So I'm not just blowing smoke. I have a lot of profound respect for the uh, Onondaga Library system because they let me come in during these neighborhood meetings and talk about things like climate change and neighborhood planning and urban heat islands. So I showed you very briefly a similar map from the city of Syracuse and apologize, my screen's a little big. Let me see if I can make this a little bit. Yeah, there we go, a little bit better. So I showed you a similar map from the city of Syracuse earlier today. You can see that there are temperature disparities. Look at that map on the left. So what this is showing us, is my, my colleagues put this together. Um, 94 degree day, that's your official weather station. You go up to Hancock uh, Airport, that was your official weather uh, reading for that day, 94 degree day in the city of Syracuse. But then look at that legend in the lower right. You can see not everywhere in Syracuse is 94 degrees. You look a lot of places are that red or that dark orange color, those are neighborhoods or those are areas that are in excess of 103 degree days. And then you can look at other places, not necessarily on this map, but look at that lower left corner that I'm circling. You have some other areas that are, you know, low 80s, relatively comfortable temperature. So why do you have these disparities? There are any number of reasons you have, but two of the more important factors as to why you have these uh, disparities is, let's look at the two maps to your right, the impervious cover and your tree cover. Your impervious cover, that's where your streets, sidewalks, highways. So you thought I was getting distracted when I talked about highways at the beginning of today's conversation. Nah, it was all part of the, the game plan. So where your highways, where your streets are, those places are going to be artificially warmer because those things, those entities are heat trapping. And then consequently, look at this, where your trees are, those, those trees are providing shade. That tree canopy is providing shade. So you can think about this 94 degree day across the city, not 94 degrees everywhere. This tells us that climate change is gonna be experienced differently. You remember, we're gonna see an increase of 94, 90 degree days in the region, but also at uh, other parts of the map. So when I go into communities, I say, this isn't just something that popped up because we decided to put a street or a road, we really have to do our homework. Right? And uh, you, you really have to look at the uh, history of 20th century urban planning to understand well, why are some neighborhoods heat islands? And it's not just warmer temperatures. We know that uh, areas that uh, got targeted for interstate siting, these are areas with heightened rates of respiratory illness. Why? Because your air quality is poor in those neighborhoods. These are areas that have heightened rates of urban heat. Why? Once again, your streets and highways are heat trapping. So there's a consequence 
to those uh, decisions that were made 80 or 90 years ago. So you'll never understand the citywide phenomenon unless you go back and then, you know, here's that urban heat island map across the entire city. And don't get worried, we're not, we're coming to your community as well. So if you're saying, well, what are the implications for Manly or so Fayetteville or wherever, uh, trust me, we'll get to you, but we're being very methodical. So let me just tell you a little bit more about this project and then we'll hand it over. So when I'm going to communities, you know, we have created a number of very cool tools. It's one thing for me to juxtapose these maps on the left or right, but we can really swipe and see, well, look at the implication right there. You know, that white, that, that white and purple, those are where your infrastructure at, the whiter it is, the more streets, or you have some type of impervious cover. And then you can see that the areas that are pretty white or off-white, those are gonna be your hotter areas. And then we can do the same thing for tree canopy. And in full disclosure, in addition to the USDA, I've been working with uh, the city of Syracuse on its urban forestry mission for the past few years. Uncompensated, so don't worry, I'm not uh, being paid by the city. So once again, where you have tree cover, it is substantially cooler. So you think about our community partners, when we get out and we do tree plantings with different neighborhoods, it's not just a question of, let's put a tree for some recreational purpose on a Saturday morning. There are real world human health, real world environmental consequences and implications. And it's not just an ecological implication. I always like to say trees keep us human, right? What does your life look like? Or what does your life sound like if you're not greeted every morning by birds chirping? Hopefully you're so well adjusted to birds chirping, you don't notice the birds chirping every day, right? Because it's just a, a habit or part of your everyday experience. Or one thing that's so sad to me is, you know, when I drive through town or ride through town and I see some neighborhoods with scarce tree cover and I automatically think, there are probably some kids in this neighborhood, they've never climbed a tree before. So my computer's about to die. Let me plug up just for a second. Give me a second. So just going back to the point that I was making, tree uh, scarce neighborhoods, it's not just a urban heat phenomenon. What are some of the other realities that folks have to forego? You know, we've been climbing trees as humans for tens of thousands of years. I don't want to live in an environment where entire swaps, entire neighborhoods of children don't have those opportunities. So just one more time, here is uh, the, the maps. And then finally, let me shout out my partners. I'm working with a fantastic organization, uh, called Onondaga Earth Corps. These are the young men and women across our city. You'll see them in their neon clad vests, purple t-shirts. They're not just planting trees, they're engaged in full-throated, full-forced environmental education. We're gonna be indebted to those uh, young people for decades to come, right? So it's not just, I'm putting up a tree this weekend. Matter of fact, they had a plant at Kirk Park just this past Saturday. Fortunately, uh, ESF had a graduation, so I was at that, um, but, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's an interesting uh, proposition when you think about we have the resources on the ground, we need to dedicate more resources uh, to that space. I've been working with the city for a couple of uh, years on their urban forest master plan. And uh, this goes back to, I think that relation started in 19, excuse me, not 19, uh, 2018, 2019. And then, you know, here's just a work day from uh, last November. That was like one of the last tree plants of the year. So if you are at all interested in today's conversation, what I'm going to do is catch my breath. I'm going to catch a cup of water and let's have some DNA, let, or excuse me, let's have some Q&A and I'm going to get caught up with the comments to my right and uh, we'll go from there. <laughs> 